Welcome to my talk. If you're new to this channel, please make sure that you check other videos that I have related to immunogenicity. So this is the second uh, part, clinical interpretation of immunogenicity. The first one was general principles. Now they are standalone, so you can uh, stay put and watch this. This relates to the antibody assays. And it's divided into parts. Part one is the antibody drug antibody test results, how to interpret them in terms of the time of their collection, the isotype and the titers, and why you should know at least a little bit about these and why these are important. So what do we need to know for the clinical interpretation whenever you receive a result that is an anti-drug antibody result, either in the clinic or from clinical trials? Antidrug antibodies are antibodies to drugs. Antibodies are the humoral immunogenic response to therapeutic drugs. And for more details, part one of this series is the general principles for the clinical interpretation of immunogenicity. So I talk in detail about what do I mean by humoral or B cell response. This particular antidrug antibody response is no different than any other B cell response. It has a primary response, which is basically the first time that your B cells will react to the drug, and a secondary response, which requires adaptive immune system memory. And this is why it's important to interpret what exactly do we have when we get results from anti-drug antibodies. Now, on the other hand, the anti-drug antibodies have the component of the drug. So the drug that is immunogenic could be an endogenous non-antibody protein. You know, I think the best known is probably insulin, but there's a lot of drugs out there that can create an immune response. They're not antibodies. But many of the recent armamentarium for therapeutic drugs include monoclonal antibodies that we engineer to target a specific uh, mechanism of action. And these are antibodies. So the complexity of the thinking of an anti-drug antibody is that your drug could be an antibody. So you have an anti-antibody antibody, and this could become a little bit like a house of mirrors. So just make sure that whenever you are interpreting anti-drug antibodies in your mind, remember what is the drug your patient received or the population in a clinical trial received and what was the anti-drug antibody assay? Did it use the same drug or did it use the endogenous protein? What exactly are you interpreting when you get these anti-drug antibody results? Let's take a look at the humoral response timing when considering the anti-drug antibodies. So one of the things that's important is that when you get the results, either from a clinical trial or from an individual that you're following in the clinic, look at the clinical assay manual. When you get the results, there's fine printing of where this test was performed or the assay, and you may have a number you can call for a clinical assay coordinator, have it handy in case that you need that for understanding exactly what was the test done and how to interpret the result. If this is in a clinical trial setting, you probably already know the clinical assay coordinator and you can have communications with them. Likewise with a clinical pharmacologist, especially because anti-drug antibody levels should always be tested with drug levels so that you can interpret is if the anti-drug antibodies that the patient is mounting to the drug is actually decreasing the exposure to that drug. It is important to understand the time of the sample collection. So this particular graph is taken from Abbas et al. And I go over this slide in much more detail in the other YouTube video called General Principles clinical interpretation of immunogenicity. But as a reminder, this is what I mean when I talk about time of sample collection. 
you need to make sure that you're assessing and understanding is this a primary or a secondary antibody response when you get anti drug antibodies. This is important because the timing, the isotypes, and the titers are different if we're talking about a primary response that can be short lived and have no consequences, or a secondary response that means you have memory, immunological memory to the drug, and it will have consequences. For so when we look at humoral response timing, this particular graph, uh, I go over it in more detail in the General Principles of Clinical Interpretation of Immunogenicity YouTube video. But a simplified version of it is shown on the right. So what you see here is that basically when you have a result, you need to understand the isotype and titer. It's not really that difficult to infer if it's a primary or a secondary response. So if you see, when we look at the isotype and titer, in a primary response, it's going to be primarily IgM. There might be some IgG, but it's a bit delayed. The antibody level is higher than at baseline, and you will actually see a peak anywhere between uh, 5 and 15 days when you are actually going to be able to detect those anti-drug antibodies. If it's a secondary response, what you see here is now the switch to an IgG titer and a significant titer booster result. This is between anywhere between 2 and 10 fold higher. Uh, it is significant, and that's why it's actually very good that you have at least two anti-drug antibody results for a particular individual, because taken in isolation, you don't know if that individual is mounting an immune response with an increase in a titer. You can also look at the levels that are normally reported as within normal levels to have an idea if this is really a significantly high titer or not. In some cases, you may get the isotype, but this is rare. Normally, uh, the anti-drug antibodies are going to be reported as total, so it's a, it's a sum of IgMs and IgGs. And that's why it, it, it even adds a bit more into the response on how much the titer is going to be critical for you to interpret. Again, if you are looking at these samples, anywhere between 14 and 28 days after either the first or the second exposure, you could be missing a, a, a primary response. For a secondary response, it will go down, but not as low as you had at baseline. But if this is your, your only sample for a patient, you might want to consider taking future samples closer to the time of dosing to understand if the patient is having a memory response with secondary titer booster. Now, do you have one or two assays? So why would you have two assays? Well, an anti-drug antibody response to two antigens could be either because you've transitioned now that we have several um, different modalities, you could be switching from one monoclonal antibody mechanism of action to another. So the patient may actually have mounted an immune response to one and now have the other antibody in addition to it, especially for some oncology indications. We're now seeing combinations of uh, biologics. So you might have two anti-drug antibodies and for more complex molecules that have bispecific mechanism of actions, you need to consider which is the anti-drug antibody that I'm looking at. Is it to the one specificity or to the other? More commonly, we also have now available uh, biologics that are pegylated and anti-peg, anti-pegylated antibodies are not that uncommon in general populations. So again, you need to understand if your patient is, re is reacting to the pegylated mo modality of the drug or to the other piece of the drug, which is the one that has the mechanism of action and the specificity. So how do you interpret anti-drug antibodies when you may have two assays? 
first of all, make sure that you see what are you looking at when you get anti-drug antibody results. Make sure that the drug is identified. What was the captured drug in the assay? And then consider what happens when you have this kind of response. So I'm leaving the right hand uh, graph, which is a simplified graph for one single antigen over time. What you see on the left is now when we have two different antigens, in this case, two different drugs or two different pieces of the drug. So the first one would be when you have the exposure to A. So let's assume that you get started with a pegylated drug and the per person has antibodies to PEG, to, to the uh, polyethylene glycol. So you might want to get baseline antibodies to understand if the patient has drugs to the pegylated piece of the drug. Then when you look at the titers, you see if it's a primary response to A, which could also be on a setting of getting two different biologics. So you have your first biologic and you get your antibodies to A. In this particular graph, I also want to mention that the blue line combines both isotypes. So it's total amount of antibodies. And what you see here, what I was explaining before, is that when you combine IgG and IgM, you can see the titers increase significantly when you get the second exposure to that first antigen. So if there is memory response to pegylation, for instance, you will get a titer booster. And it's a significant booster. In this particular graph, you can see it's a logarithmic scale. So it is significantly higher when you get that secondary response. And if we compare that to the graph on the right, would be adding up all of the isotypes that would be reacting to that first antigen. Now, during the second exposure, you may have the two antibodies. So you may have started your pegylated drug. And at that point, what you need to understand is the antibodies to the active part of the, of the molecule or the selective part of your molecule will be reacting as a primary response. Although here, again, in the left-hand side graph, we have all isotypes together on a primary response is basically going to be IgM in terms of the isotype, and the titer is going to be lower. So if you have taken into consideration any particular circumstance when you have two drugs, make sure that when you get these results, you get them separate for the two different drugs because also for the second drug when or the second modality, the titers are going to be lower. So make sure that you don't get all together or that you are not getting only the response to A so that you can then manage the responses and understand what's happening in a better way. Clinical interpretation of immunogenicity antibody assays part two is basically going to be a very high level explanation of the assay so that you can understand better how to interpret the results and understand what is being assayed and how. So before we go into the assay for detecting anti-drug antibodies, I just want to remind you um, a more thorough explanation was done on part one of the immunogenicity series in YouTube. But just remember that you have a drug uh, the drug can be an antibody or a protein. <clears throat> this particular drug has a drug target. The drug target can be soluble, as shown on the left, or bound to a membrane, as shown on the right. So you have a drug and you have a natural drug target uh, that is in the human beings that you want to modulate. When you have anti-drug antibodies, they could be binding the functional site of the drug. And so this is what we know as neutralizing antibodies. And they may be competing with a natural target. So in other words, uh, these anti-drug antibodies can decrease the efficacy of your drug. Anti-drug antibodies could also bind outside 
the antigen binding site and your drug could still be able to engage with the target. Uh, in these cases, because it's binding the FC portion and the FC portion has several effector functions, uh, you need to understand if this particular binding outside the antigen binding site is impacting efficacy. For more details on what I'm saying now about how they can affect efficacy even if they're binding outside the antigen binding site or in other words if they're not neutralizing antibodies they could still be impacting efficacy uh, please see part one of immunogenicity series when detecting anti-drug antibodies there's a few things that might be good to know so the first thing is the detection methodology called the Metroscale Discovery uh, Platform, which is the MSD platform. Uh, basically, how this uh, works is you have your drug uh, that is now depicted on the green, uh, and that drug actually is uh, bound to the solid assay. So it's on your plate. It's captured the drug that you're using. If a patient has developed anti-drug antibodies, these antibodies, when you wash the plate with the patient's serum, will bind to the drug that's solid phase attached on your platform. And then uh, once you wash out the rest of the blood from the patient on this assay, the anti-drug antibodies remain bound to the drug. And then you use the same drug uh, that's labeled to get a reading. This is a very easy way to understand the concept of how an anti-drug antibody assay is done. Now, what are the many challenges and why are we talking about validating these assays? And when you get uh, false positives, false negatives, what's happening? It seems like a seemingly simple idea, but it's not that easy. So the major challenges that we have found are what we call a target interference that can lead to false positive results and drug tolerance that can lead to false negative results. So if you hear target interference or drug tolerance when, uh, when analyzing the assays that you were using to detect anti-drug antibodies, uh, I hope this talk will be a bit more clear in how this is working. So let's talk about target interference. Your drug is actually designed to bind a target. And when that target is soluble, then when you are actually detecting the blood from your patient, let's say that this patient has absolutely no anti-drug antibodies, but they have the soluble target. So if you're using an anti-VGEF as your drug, well, the patient has VGEF circulating or an anti-TNF. Well, the patient can have the TNF circulating in the blood. Most likely they do. So when you're using the blood on this assay, because you have actually designed your drug to bind that soluble target, now what you are actually detecting is this soluble target binds the solid phase capture drug, and it will also be detected by the label drug. This is why the target interference produces false positive results. There are many different ways that in the validation of your assays, can be done like acid dissociation, incubation overnight. So there are many different ways to make sure that when testing the samples from patients, the, the serum from patients, it does not have that soluble target or the soluble target has been diluted sufficiently. However, you should not be diluting anti-drug antibodies that could be in the patient's blood. So this is one uh, of the key challenges when validating any drug antibodies. It's called target interference. And that's, again, when your target is a soluble target because you're using serum samples from the blood. And most likely, these patients have that soluble target in the blood. What is drug tolerance? 
Drug tolerance is another one of the key factors when looking at anti-drug antibodies uh, in terms of the assay because it can actually lead to false negative results. So in this case, what I'm depicting here is the drug in the blood. So this is the drug that you're dosing the patient with. I have put a different uh, sort of uh, lines around these uh, images because you have to remember we're using the same drug that's captured on the solid face and we are using the same drug that's labeled. So now the patient has drug in the blood because you've been dosing the patient and let's say the patient does have anti-drug antibodies but they're bound to the drug in the blood. So when the patient has a serum sample with antibodies that are bound to the drug in the blood that you gave them, they may have a free site that could still bind to the solid phase capture drug, but they don't have any more sites to actually be able to detect it with the labeled drug that you're bringing. And that's why even in the presence of anti-drug antibodies, you can have a false negative result if there's still sufficient drug in the blood. So this is one of the reasons why we need to understand when is this uh, sample taken and the validation assays for that particular drug. These examples pertain to drugs that are therapeutic proteins as antigens. Anti-drug antibody detection to drugs that are also antibodies and act as potential antigens uh, is uh, similar to therapeutic protein assays using the mesoscale discovery or the MSD platform. In a simplistic way, I will explain what uh, that assay is and how we could understand the challenges. Basically, you have uh, the drug that's depicted here in green and it has been bound to the solid phase. When you run the blood from the patient, if that patient has anti-drug antibodies, they will bind to the drug that you have captured on the plate. And when you bring an, uh, a drug that's labeled, then that drug will also bind the anti-drug antibodies and you will get a result for presence of anti-drug antibodies. When your drug is an antibody itself, it can be a bit confusing. So that's why I think sometimes that these images can help. Now, what are the challenges in this case that seems a seemingly simple assay? Well, we can have target interference that gives false positive results, or you can have drug tolerance that can produce false negative results. And this can happen when, for instance, your uh, target for your drug is a soluble target. So you have engineered a drug that binds a soluble target. It could be a TNF, for instance, which is a cytokine, could be any other kind of interleukin. So you can have antibodies to soluble targets, could be VGEF, you know, growth factor. If that soluble target is in the patient's blood, which mo most likely it is, when you do this assay and you use the blood from patients, that soluble target will be bound to the, to the drug that you have on the plate. Your drug, again, has been engineered to bind this soluble target. So now, instead of having an anti-drug antibody in the serum, you have the soluble target in the serum it binds the captured drug and it will be identified by the labeled drug. That's the reason why target can interfere with the assay and in the complete absence of anti-drug antibodies could produce a false positive result because what you're actually measuring is not anti-drug antibodies, is the soluble target. Part of the validation of all of these assays is to find the ways in the protocol for the lab when you are sending the blood from your patients to be tested, the laboratory needs to provide and understand the validation of the assay itself and if they need to pre-incubate the blood 
Sometimes it's pre-incubation with certain buffers, like with acid buffers. Uh, there are sometimes incubation with the drug itself and then washing out so that you could get rid of the soluble target without getting rid of anti-drug antibodies in the blood because those are the ones that you need to detect. So when you're looking at anti-drug antibodies, just make sure you understand what is the assay you're using, the validation, make sure you use a validated company and assay when they're commercially available so that you understand what is the probability of false positive results if there is a soluble target in the case of your, the drug you're using. The other situation is what we call the drug tolerance. So now imagine that your patient actually has drug in the blood. And so this drug in the blood could be circulating. And now this drug in the blood is going to actually uh, be bound by anti-drug antibodies. So in this case, the patient has anti-drug antibodies and they may have a valence available to bind the biotin captured on the solid phase. So your drug has been designed to actually be bound as a capture and also as a labeled drug. But when you have the complex of the anti-drug antibody and the drug in the blood, your labeled drug is no longer going to be able to detect that anti-drug antibody because it's already bound by your drug in the blood. So in this case, it is important to know what is the half-life of the drug. Has the assay been validated? to be detected after five half-lives. For instance, when you already know there's no more drug in the blood of that patient, or is there anything you can do to assess the true uh, false negatives, if there's really any drug antibodies and how this assay has been actually characterized. I hope this is helpful. It's a complex uh, theme. And I think sometimes putting it in images may be helpful. If you have other questions or if you want to know more about immunogenicity, please feel free to subscribe to my channel and see the other available videos. The neutralizing antibody assays are based on the following principle. The non-cell based assay will have the drug capture on a solid phase and the soluble target is labeled is used on the plate and when there's the engagement of the drug and the target of that drug, there will be a signal that is measurable and quantifiable. So this would be the normal response to the, to the drug. To this particular assay, you then use the blood from patients. If the patient's blood do not have neutralizing antibodies, this will work and there will be a signal. However, if the blood from the patients have antibodies which have neutralizing ability, they will bind the FAB portion and they will compete with the label target and there will be no signal. This is the way to determine the neutralizing antibodies when you have a soluble target. It's non-cell based assay because the target that's labeled in the assay, it's non-cell based, it's a soluble target. The cell based assay neutralizing antibody tests are used when the drug binds a cell receptor as a target. And what you measure is basically when that drug engages with the receptor, there would be a signal on that cell, and the cell will then be. Uh, prepared in this assay for sending a signal that we can measure. A cell-based assay neutralizing antibody is usually a bit more complicated than when you have a soluble target, but it may be necessary when your drug requires that neutralizing activity to be measured in the living target cells. Again, these are modified so that when the receptor the target cell receptor is engaged by the drug, they will emit a signal that's measurable.
So by having this assay, when you incubate now the drug that's in the solid phase with the blood from the patient, if the blood from the patient has neutralizing antibodies, that means that the drug will no longer be able to bind the target on the cell. And by not binding, these cells would not be stimulated and there's no signal. So that's how the neutralizing antibody cell-based assays work in a principle. There are many other ways of doing it and this is an area of very active research and there's more and more ways to look at neutralizing antibodies when you do whole cells for detecting that particular ability of blocking the function of the drug. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like on the YouTube channel. And if you are new to my channel or you have come back but you haven't subscribed, please consider subscribing to my channel. Thank you very much. I hope this was useful and see you next time.